Yeah. Okay, well, hello everyone and, and welcome to our last uh, reproducibility session of 2020. Um, and yeah, and we're delighted to see so many of you guys turn up on the last day of term. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, and we hope that you enjoy today's session, which will be uh, some local researchers from Edinburgh University uh, sharing their experiences with open research practices. So we have Marlon Magales Pinto, we have Dan Merriman and Melissa Thai, as well as Hilary, Richardson and Zach Horn and they'll be sharing their experiences with a variety of open science methods and practices including how to share research materials um, op just kind of general open research culture as well as pre-registration so I think I'll hand it over to Marlene and excuse the dog barking outside um, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that um, but yeah so I'll um, hand it over to Marlene and she'll get started thanks very much Oh, and also, sorry, before we do that, um, what we're going to do is we'll, so we have like a series of uh, three, four talks, and then um, if that's okay, we'll, we'll leave questions until the end. Um, but if you do have questions, like kind of throughout the talks, pop them into the chat and Laura is going to moderate that and then we'll, we can bring them up with the Q&A session at the end. Um, and I think that's, that's all I had to cover in terms of housekeeping, so. Thank you very much for the introduction. So actually I'm at work and if my if I can see my internet is dropping down, I will turn off also my camera because I have some signal that says that the signal is bad. So I'm sorry, it's the Wi-Fi at work. So thank you very much for the invitation. So today my talk is uh, called Academia's Little Health Under Pressure, a postdoc perspective on research culture. So here I put that uh, it was uh, N of one myself uh, wait, I'm going to just try to, uh, 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 no, I can't, can you see my, uh, yeah, so it's an N of one, but pooled samples. So because here I have a disclaimer, it's just like the views I'm going to express here as are my own, but actually uh, I'm in touch with a lot of postdocs and a lot of academic uh, staff because I'm part of the BioQuarter Postdoc Society. I also pushed for a discussion around the uh, research culture at the BioQuarter back in February this year. So uh, I would like to say I'm just an average postdoc, but actually I'm a bit more aware about uh, these topics than maybe an average postdoc, if I can say this. So I'm, I feel like I'm neither super involved with open research initiative, but I'm not also super detached from it. So I might make mistakes, uh, just so you know. So this was my disclaimer. And also I'm uh, here to learn. So, oh no. Ah, yeah, good. So this is how I see a bit uh, academia. So uh, there is here Santa, so Santa Academia. So we are all working uh, for Santa Academia. So all year round, we are making incredible science, incredible data. We are producing a lot of things for the society, you know, for academia. So we are these little uh, elves here. But sometimes we ask ourselves some questions about data that we are producing. And once upon a time, I asked myself, what is actually open science and what should I do with my data? So my journey into research culture and open science started on the 4th of June 2019. So I went to an event about research culture and fair science. So fair science means findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. So this uh, event was organized at the BioQuarter in the QMRI uh, by Dr. Ralitza Matson. Uh, so actually Ralitza was in my office at the time. She, we just shared an office for like few weeks. So I don't know if I went there because I knew her or if I went there because I knew some speakers. But anyway, I went there and it was uh, incredible because I became much more aware about a lot of things. So for example, that a healthy research culture should improve uh, include open science, reproducibility, impact-based and not impact factor-based academic assessments, and also ethical publishing, because you want to read papers and you don't want to pay to read papers. Uh, so this day was actually amazing because I learned a lot about what was actually open science, because I, I wasn't really sure, actually. I learned, I learned about, a lot about preprint, um, about the reproducibility crisis as well. So it was great. One of the main uh, information I had also is when I saw a talk uh, given by the research data services. 
So, uh, because I wasn't too sure where to put my data, where to store them, but on this day, they show all these uh, graphs uh, explaining where you should put your data. Stop using Dropbox or whatever, the cloud or whatever. Just use what university uh, uh, gives you. So this was uh, great. Um, also, uh, I think this, um, this event was a starting point for Ben and others to start the Edinburgh, Edinburgh Open Science uh, Open Research Initiative. And at the time, I was at the first meeting with Ben and others and other PhD students and other uh, staff, or maybe I was the only postdoc anyway. And I remember meeting in the pub at Teviot with a pint and just discussing about what we should do, what we could do for uh, open research in Edinburgh. So it's great to see that this initiative is actually pushed forward by Ben. And uh, I wish maybe if I have time to continue working with him. So back in this year, January 2020, I got slapped in the face by, I'm sure most of you got slapped us in the face, by this Welcome Trust survey on research culture. So this survey uh, included a lot of uh, researchers. Um, it was mainly uh, people in academia. So here I highlighted like the most, uh, like the people were more like mid-career, early res uh, career researcher, like postdocs, few PhD students, more in biomedical science, also social sciences. They were mainly white, female, and with no disability. But regardless, I think there was a pretty good picture of academia. I think there was 4,000 people replying to the survey. And on this survey, they made a little uh, uh, world cloud of uh, the words that were um, combined um, to describe research culture. And uh, if you took one minute to look at it, it's quite depressing, to be honest. So it's quite a, a bad words, like competitive. Well, the competition could be good, but stressful, pressured, toxic, biased, which is quite worrying to see this in science because we should just be conducting research. Um, this is a good one, collaborative, good. But uh, all of these words actually were, they were quite bad. And actually, a lot of people associated research culture as a negative thing and not a positive thing. This graph, uh, I think it was the most alarming for me because it was talking about mental health. And uh, uh, if um, researchers are sought or receive professional help for depression, anxiety during their research career. So 44% said no. 3% uh, said they don't want to say so, but there is actually more than 50% that actually either search for help or um, um, has sought help but have not received it, uh, received it or would like to have uh, received help at the time. So here, when you look at all of this problem about anxiety, depression, but how can academia, how can we fix it? Uh, I asked one of my friends, Adrienne Asmus, so uh, go follow her and go see her art. But she made this little uh, cartoon that is really representative of how I feel. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to see this and see like, oh yeah, this is actually also how I feel to be a postdoc or to be in research. So you have a lot of things going on in your life. Uh, as a postdoc, sadly, we have very short contracts. So it can range from one or two years usually, very rarely five years. We working long hours, uh, we have other worries in life, and we have a big pressure to publish. So now uh, this pressure to publish, or these long hours, these short contracts, can bring a lot of anxiety. And I'm going to just show you my own worries as a postdoc, and how I feel like an open science and open research culture, healthy research culture could help improve things. So let's get a bit personal, but I hope some of you will, might see themselves in this. So I changed labs actually during the lockdown, so I moved postdoc. I also moved, you know, from my PhD to my postdoc. And there is one question uh, about what do I do actually with my data, especially if you have a lot of images that are really big. Should I put in a hard drive or what should I do with all of this data? Well. What I learned is like PIs can actually like knowledge. It's not because uh, they don't want to know, it's just because they are already so involved into other things that I think trying to find the best ways to keep data 
you know, it's out of reach for them. So they let us either think about it. But it's good actually to have a conversation with the PI, like how, where should I put my data once I finished? So I feel like it could be good for the university to create maybe a data checklist at the end of the contract to be sure that your data actually put somewhere that is safe and not going to be lost. <clears throat> but also maybe at the beginning of the contract to have an induction on how to, um, where to put your data, because I was lucky enough that I did my PhD in Edinburgh. So I already knew a bit about the data services and I knew a bit about, you know, data sync, OneDrive and all of these things. But I feel like for a new um, postdoc that, you know, postdocs are moving a lot. And for someone new arriving here, it can be quite difficult to know. So it's better to know who to ask this question to. But I know that you should ask this question, for example, to the research data service. That is amazing. And they have an amazing website, like, <coughs> sorry, where you can find a lot of information. Second worry is when you leave a lab or when you enter a new lab, you ask yourself your question, uh, this question is, what if I can't replicate or reproduce a result? Uh, like, what am I supposed to do with this? And there is two things that happen usually in a lab. Uh, you would have uh, some lab books from uh, the postdoc number uh, 23 that is now back in France, it does not answer emails. So you would have no idea uh, if something doesn't work, if it's because you can't read what it's written on this lab book, or you know if there is any issues you're not aware of. The second thing is uh, you read a paper, and this paper it says, look, the method worked. Uh, look at these amazing results. And then you're like, oh yeah, I want to do the same thing. And then you discover the method uh, bit. We use the method previously described. And it's almost like they say to you, good luck to find it, because you click and click and click to the reference, so you never find actually where uh, the method come from. And it's quite fr frustrating. So one of the um, solutions is to use our space, for example, or to deposit data. It should be mandatory. Um, so I feel like also, um, I am not using our space yet, but I'm talking about our space a lot, so I might uh, get there. But I feel like during my PhD, if I use our space, because it could have been uh, great, because right now, for example, I'm still writing papers linked to my PhD, and I need to go back to things, I need to go back to uh, my lab books or etc. And it's much more harder than if I had it on our space and just you know one click away of finding all the information, and also for the people that are actually doing revision for the paper, for example. The second thing that is bringing me, and I think a lot of people anxiety is like the imposter syndrome, is like, what if people can't reproduce or replicate my results? Uh, well, one good thing is you can also use our space to go back and to uh, look at all your data and, and to spot any mistakes because it's okay to make mistakes. It's fine as long as you can spot them and, you know, uh, and report them. It's fine. And also deposit your data somewhere because then you, they're accessible and people can find also mistakes for you. And I think I would have much more or less an imposter syndrome if, if all of this was put in place. Also, uh, one thing is I keep learning. Uh, there's nothing wrong in keeping learning. I know I'm a postdoc, I did a PhD, you know, I should know a lot of things. But actually, right now, I'm doing the data, skill, the data skill course. So I'm relearning a bit about statistics, stuff that I've made, I've forgotten. And I think it's okay just to do this. So you can find the link here uh, if you want to subscribe, find to um, go to the course, it's still possible. Another worry is how can I progress my career if I can't publish in nature? Uh, because sometimes your data doesn't fit with nature, they don't want to, they reject it. But why do I think this? Why do I think that publishing in nature is so important? Well, it's all linked to the research culture and also how researchers are assessed. And if you look back at the, at the, the, the Welcome Trust survey, you can see that actually a lot of us have a very bad um, view on how we are assessed. So for example, in this question, I think current metrics have had a positive impact on research culture. Disagree. My institution placed more values on meeting metrics than does on research quality. Agree. <laughs> And this one also linked to anxiety and stuff is I feel pressured to meet key performances indicator metric, blah, blah, blah. For 54% agree about the pressure. And I think this pressure can impact highly on research integrity, whether you can admit it uh, or not. So I know that uh, Edinburgh Uni signed the declaration of research, research assessment. 
which stipulate the need to eliminate the use of journal-based metrics, so to say no to impact factors. But how do I feel when I look around me and look at other postdocs or PhD students or PIs, I still feel that the impact factor is important, regardless of the DORA. And that actually we should emphasize more um, the importance of the quality of work, the fair science, and if someone is involved in a good research culture and research practices. Which also led me to uh, this little question is, what do I do if I get negative results? Should I give up academia? Because, you know, negative results mean they're worth nothing. I'm showing nothing. Well, I'm thinking this, but I shouldn't as well. We, we should change, simply change research culture. So I just wanted to add um, a little idea that uh, I had and with the postdoc society is that maybe we should organize talks or maybe a day, like a two hours conference type of style, where we just focus on negative results. Because if you conduct a research that is uh, fair, so you know that, uh, there is, why wouldn't be you be able to, to publish it? There is no reason why you shouldn't be able to publish it and, uh, and make it accessible, because if you make it accessible to people, people won't do the same experiment, they won't repeat, they're gonna waste money and time to do this, and maybe a negative result can lead to positive results in the future. So the last uh, bit of my talk is just I saw some questions online about, but why should we or why should I put effort into like promoting open science if there is no career benefits? Because so far, I think we, we don't say enough to people that yes, there sh sh they should be a career benefit to uh, promote open science. So I feel like actually open science helped me um, at my CV. For example, I preprints at my CV. I know that preprints, for example, can help grant application. If I put my data accessible, I'm going to have more citations. So all my data, I think my single cell, RNA, single cell RNA data are going to be deposited into a GEO after um, when I publish. So it can bring more citation. Uh, research assessment can be changed. So if more people are involved in open science, you can also, um, you know, assess them based on this. It can also reduce the stress because if you put time and effort, maybe at the beginning to have a lab journal, like a R space and to deposit your data and, and make sure that everything is safe, maybe your stress level are gonna go down and maybe the imposter, in, uh, imposter uh, syndrome are gonna go uh, down. And this one, this last one is a bit like, oh, cost and management, who is responsible? Because I know that it, it can cost money. And uh, as a postdoc, uh, I don't have the money yet, uh, but I can spread awareness to my PIs that they maybe can include um, the costing in their grants. They can be using our space. They can be publishing in, in open access journals that do not cost uh, 9,000 uh, pounds. Why am I saying this? It's just because I was very excited when I see that nature's has a new open access journal. And then I saw my one of my favorite uh, Twitter um, uh, uh, that I'm following, a uh, Twitter pal, Elizabeth Bick, that was uh, tweeting about an article about this. And then I read the article. And then when I read the article, I found out that, oh my God, uh, yeah, Nature charged 9,500 euros to publish uh, in an open access journal. Uh, and also, they uh, pay, do you have to pay also for a review? So I found this uh, in incredible. I think I left. But I feel like it's still one step towards something good, open access. But uh, maybe we can do something different about it. But uh, let's see what the, <clears throat> what the future holds. So thanks for your attention. And I just want to say that let's, we can try to change the picture, like this like quite worrying picture, by using open science and reimagining research culture and how we perceive research and what is expected from us. I know that good things are happening. So, for example, have a look at this. Have a look at the Concordat. I don't have time now to speak about it, but just read this. And thanks for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Marlon. That was fantastic. And as Laura said, 10 out of 10 for your festive slides. Um, I particularly loved the one about um, when the elf was asking if he was even an elf. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we'll move on to Dan and Melissa now, and then we'll, you know, have have questions at the end, as I said. And yeah, but please feel free to to pop your questions into the chat, and then we can revisit them later. Okay, so I don't know if you need to stop sharing your screen, Marlon. Oh yeah, great. Am I, is my screen yeah. showing up? Yeah, that's, right, cool. that's perfect.
Um, thank you. Um, so we, in the context of this group, we talk a lot about um, the value of open science, and I thought, and, and Laura and Eve um, suggested that it would be useful to talk about like how to actually do the open science, um, like where you're supposed to put your data and materials and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I've tried lots of these platforms. I don't claim to be a huge expert about them, but um, but I thought I would share some of my thoughts about those. And uh, Melissa T uh, can talk about um, also some of the practicality of doing that. Um, OK, so one of the nice things is that we now have lots of platforms for sharing data. There's there's sort of general public repositories like OSF. There's uh, repositories that are specific for particular kinds of uh, materials. Um, so like GitHub for sharing code or Open Neuro for sharing neuroimaging data um, and lots of other ones. You can also set up a personal or lab website or um, institutional or journal repositories, and you can also make your own um, data sharing site. So I'll, I'll talk real quickly about these. Um, and, and the kind of considerations you want to keep in mind when you're thinking about how you want to share your materials are, I think, fall into a couple of groups. Um, one is flexibility, right? So can the platform accommodate the kind or format of material that you want to share? Um, how much effort is it going to be? I, um, I mean, we don't want to stress ourselves out even more <laughs> than we're already stressed out. Um, so how much work will it be to, to set up the repository? Um, accessibility and longevity. Um, is it behind a paywall? Uh, who's responsible for the long-term stability of it? Um, do you trust those people? <laughs> Um, and, the, and the utility, so how easy is it for users to get the materials that they want um, from the platform? So those are just kind of like general principle considerations. Um, so I'll kind of walk through the different options. Um, so general public repositories, at OSF is probably the, the most familiar one. Um, and the, the pros here are that they're, they're super flexible, you know, or OSF in particular is very flexible. You can post any kind of file type. Um, and OSF also has, um, like you can set up a wiki, you can uh, do pre-registration on there that, that I think Hillary and Zach are gonna talk about um, that approach. Um, you can also link OSF with other tools. Um, OSF has nice privacy options. So, so projects are private by default, um, but you can generate links that you could include, for example, in a manuscript um, that's under review, um, or you can make it fully public. Um, so that's convenient. It's also long term stable without your involvement. So you can put your stuff on OSF and then kind of forget about it and it just lives there and someone else is responsible for making sure that it remains accessible um, and free. So that's that's nice features. Um, downside is um, sort of the flip side of the flexibility is that um, you have to come up with a structure and organizational um, approach for your for your stuff. Um, they have recently implemented a storage cap. So for private projects, it's five gigabytes, um, 50 for public ones, but you can link it to other data storage places. So you could have your data on OneDrive and link it to OSF. Um, that one works well, um, and Melissa will talk more about that. Um, in some cases, you might want to consider a type specific repository. The two, the two ones that I think a lot about are um, for neuroimaging data, open neuro, and for sharing code on GitHub. They're less flexible, um, but they might offer very useful features um, that for a particular file type. So um, open neuro uses the bids format. Um, it saves you from having to come up with a way of organizing your neuroimaging data and other users should know what bids is and then they'll be able to navigate your data. Um, that sometimes Sometimes these have rigid um, privacy options. So GitHub is a good example. It has really good version control. It's very good for collaborative development. So like different people can be writing code and working on it. Um, and if someone like introduces a bug into the code, they can be rolled back. Um, users can flag issues. Um, many software packages have Git integration. So like if you use R, you can install packages from GitHub directly. Um, that's nice. Um, in general, GitHub is completely public. Um, there are ways of making it private, but they're a little tricky um, and not always accessible. So in general, everything's public, so you kind of have to be comfortable with that.
can also make your own. Um, this has the most flexibility. Um, and that's useful if you want certain kinds of things. Um, it can also help develop your kind of personal professional brand. Um, uh, but you're develop you're responsible for the content. Um, and for the design and everything like that, so that, that can be a lot of work. Um, uh, so the the Moss Aphasia Psycholinguistics Project Databases is a online database that I helped build when I worked at Moss. That we hired a programmer to build it and maintain it. Um, but then like someone hacked it. Uh, this was a ridiculous thing because like who wants to hack this? But someone hacked it and put some malicious code in there so that when people um, so the reason we set it up was because we wanted users to be able to do database searches directly from from the browser. Um, but when they would hit submit for their search, it would take them to a like um, illegal illegal Viagra sale website. Um, so that was not great for our professional brand. Um, uh, so we had to fix that. But like, so those are the kinds of problems you run into when you have to do stuff yourself. Um, uh, I, I have a, a, a lab website, um, which I, I like to have um, like a personal professional lab page, but then it's like a bunch of work to maintain it. Um, it's kind of a hassle sometimes, but I like it anyway. Um, there's also preprint servers um, that are just specifically for sharing preprints um, that, that can be useful for that as well. Um, I think those are probably the most simple, so I don't have much more to say about it. As a, as a kind of last point, um, don't, I kind of walked through a bunch of different options just now. Um, don't get overwhelmed by having a lot of different choices. Um, if you're not sure, just try something. And um, if it works, keep using it and uh, make the most of its features. If you don't like it, then next time try something else. Um, so in, in my lab, we've sort of gravitated towards using OSF because we like the flexibility and the good privacy control. So I'm going to turn it over to Melissa, who's built some really fantastic OSF sites for our projects, um, and she can share some of the tips for um, making OSF work for you. Okay, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Yes. Great. Let me make this bigger. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on some of the information um, Dan just presented and talk specifically about OSF. And I think the main thing I want to leave everyone with is how easy it is to get started and just really encourage everyone to like have a go. Um, so here I'm just showing like genuinely how easy it is to sign up. You can just give name, email, or link it with your ORCID ID for an even quicker option. Um, and once you have an account, you can start building a project. Um, and so there's two main ways to do that. The first option, which might be a little bit easier if you're first getting started, is to use a pre-existing project structure. So you can find a previous project, maybe from somebody in your research group, or you can find a publicly available project or template. And so I've linked some of those here, and I think these slides will be available afterwards if anyone's interested in that resource. Um, but one of those templates is for exploratory projects, which I'm showing here. And so it already has this built-in structure where it has theoretical background, methods, data, analytic code separated out. And so if this would be a structure that would be useful in kind of conducting your own research and having your own project, you can simply duplicate this template and it'll be your own project space and it'll be private by default and you can kind of start from there without having to worry about all of that initial setup. The second option is to create your own. And this also really isn't that time consuming, although you do have to come up with your own um, kind of data structure. Um, so I'm just again showing here, you just create new projects, give a title, you can provide a description, but all of this can be edited later. Um, and just by doing that, this is kind of what your project page would look like. Um, and there were a few things I wanted to highlight for anyone who hasn't used OSF before, um, things, features of OSF that I particularly enjoy. Um, so you can add new collaborators who can view and or edit at any time. And so this is nice if you work collaboratively with a research group. It's nice if you work collaborative, collaboratively with people who you kind of want them to see the materials or results, but not necessarily edit it. So you do have that, um, that benefit. 
You also have this wiki page where you can include relevant project information. I like to think of the wiki page as something of a of readme document um, to help orient other people to all of the details of your project. And so you can kind of use that as much or as little as you like. Um, if you are starting your own project from scratch, you can easily create folders and upload files. You can even just drag and drop files. So it's a very user friendly interface. And all activity is recorded here. So you or any other contributor or collaborator on the project, any changes they make to the wiki page, any new files they upload, all of that's going to be recorded here. So it's nice to keep track of like larger projects that way. And then like Dan mentioned, new projects are private by default. So if that's a concern for your research group, you kind of have that assurance um, and you can make it public at any time. Some benefits, um, some of which Dan touched on and some of which are, are things that I particularly like about OSF is that most file types can be uploaded and many can be viewed easily. So that includes script files. I think a number of people here use R, so you can open a browser and easily view the script that somebody used. You can view participant spreadsheets, any Excel documents. You can view figures, any results. Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing this so much is because if you really want to get a sense of someone's project and they have everything built on OSF, you can go to their OSF project page and easily see everything in the browser without having to download anything. Um, so it just makes it that much easier to use, both for people interested in, in using other people's OSF pages and also for you setting it up. There's built in version control, so if you ever need to revert back to a previous version of a wiki page or a previous script, OSF allows for that really easily. Um, and also, like Dan mentioned, you can create these view only anonymized links for peer review. So if you're not quite ready to make a project public, um, but you do want peer reviewers to have access to your materials and code, um, you can do that easily, um, and that's a really nice option. And then again, like I mentioned, I think several people here use R. So I wanted to highlight a nice R package that interfaces nicely with OSF called OSF R. And I've demonstrated some of the utility of that here. Um, so you can really write R code that somebody could download and they can run it and it will download all of the data from OSF and they don't have to mess with changing paths or doing anything. So that lessens the burden and makes everything that much easier for everybody um, to replicate your results kind of some tips and suggestions um, on what I think makes a good OSF project page, though I think it could be an interesting discussion of what other people think as well. Um, I think you should create the project assuming it will be made public. And the reason I emphasize that is because it encourages you to document the entire research pro progress and write code and share materials. Um, assuming someone's going to have to read it someday, right? You're not just writing it for you. You're going to assume someone's going to come along and try to replicate it or make sense of the analysis that you did. Um, this benefits other researchers in your own lab. You know, if they're interested in doing a similar analysis, you've documented everything, and so it's going to be easier for them to do that. Um, this obviously benefits other researchers outside of your lab if you do end up making that project public. And I think something that we've emphasized at a previous reproducibility session, and it also benefits future you, right? Because we all think we'll know all of the details of the analysis we ran three to six months from now, and we almost certainly won't. Um, so it's nice to be really thorough documenting the research pro process and know that you're also going to benefit from that. Um, I also suggest sort of adopting a standard way of organizing files. I think maybe this has different demands for different research groups, but I tend to like a very simplistic structure of just having a data folder, a results folder, and a scripts folder, and you can obviously have subfolders within those, but across all of the different projects I work on, kind of adopting that same structure. So when you write scripts, they're sort of um, structured in the same way. Um, and I recommend using the wiki page as something of a lab notebook, and this is particularly relevant if you set up a project page at the beginning of a project. Um, and I find this useful because you can have several different wiki pages. You can embed figures and tables. You can link to important references. Um, and one feature that I think is really nice about OSF is that you can link directly to scripts, right? So you can be describing a, an analysis and then link directly to that script and then embed a figure of what it looks like when you run that script. So I find that that makes everything a little bit more transparent as well for you and other people. And finally, I wanted to emphasize, you know, when to set up an OSF project page anytime. Um, I think you don't necessarily have to have set it up at the beginning. You can set it up in the middle or at the end of the project, um, although I do think there's pros and cons, right, um, which I think Dan touched on a little bit. Um, if you set it up at the beginning of the project, obviously you can kind of document the research progress as you go. Um, but there maybe is that initial time commitment and having to set up 
this OSF page for a project you're not sure um, is going to ever be made public, right? Um, so one suggestion that I think could be interesting for discussion is this idea of research groups setting up those template project pages like I showed on a previous slide so that collabor collaborators and other students can simply duplicate that template and they don't have to worry about that initial time set up. They can just get started. Um, so that really encourages setting up an OSF page at the beginning and thoroughly documenting the process. Um, and there's also consistent data structure in that way. Um, it could communicates the expectations for documenting, documenting the research process um, and promotes sharing materials because you're using a platform that can easily be made public if that project is published at some point. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing other people's ideas. Um, thank you for your time. Great, thanks very much, Miss. That was yeah, really, really interesting. And it was great to see like a worked example of, of the OSF. And yeah, thanks to Dan as well for introducing the, the topics. So we'll move on to our our last kind of uh, kind of speaker session for, for today. So Zach and Hilary are going to present on pre-registration. So if you guys want to share your screen. Great. Okay, can you see that and hear me? Yep, all good. Excellent, great. Um, so yeah, thank you again for organizing this session. It's been great so far. Um, this little bit is just going to be about pre-registrations, just a little bit of an introduction to what pre-registrations are, the issues that they fix or try to address, um, and some personal anecdotes from, from our own research. So just briefly, um, we're both lecturers in PPLS at Edinburgh. Um, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. Zach, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, I'm a cognitive scientist. I'm interested in uh, reasoning and thinking and uh, social cognition. Perfect. Yeah, so quite different, um, different and similar in some ways. OK, so what issue is pre-registration trying to address? Um, the main issue that it's trying to address is that um, standard scientific practice involves analytic freedom. So what this means is that when we um, pose a question and uh, you know formulate a method to try to address it, there end up being lots of different decision points and exactly what we mean by how we address it. So, um, you know, we have uh, an experiment and a number of participants and conditions and things like that. Um, but there are all these little mini decisions that end up mattering um, for, for the results that we get. So, for example, how many participants is enough? Do we have a stopping criterion or do we just kind of keep going until the results, you know, make sense to us? Um, what's exclusion criterion? So how do we define an outlier? Um, what counts as a, as a participant whose data we think are um, of poor data quality? Um, analysis choices, so which covariates are of interest? Um, which ones do we want to control for? Um, should we use the raw variables or should we normalize them? Um, and then uh, something called family of comparisons. So when we have some um, some construct of interest like language. Well, you can measure language in a, in a child um, uh, many different ways. You can measure their vocabulary size, you can measure their receptive grammar, you can measure their mean length utterance. Let's say you measure all of them, then which one is going to be the key one to your analyses or, or are you going to look at all of them? Um, so at the end of the day, um, Brian Nosek in 2018 put this quote in a paper which I think sum summarized the issue quite well. Um, he says, a vast number of choices for analyzing data can be made. If those choices are made during analysis, observing the data may make some paths more likely and others less likely. And by the end, it may be impossible to estimate the paths that could have been selected if the data had looked different. Um, and so the solution here is that, um, is that if you pre-register your analysis plan, so first you do some exploratory work or a pilot study, then you form a prediction and specify the analysis model completely, and then you share that. That's called a pre-registration. You write down what your plan is and you share it publicly. And then the third step is actually testing the prediction in data. Um, and so uh, platforms for this include, as predicted, um, Center for Open Science, which um, Melissa and Dan just, just spoke about a bit, and then clinicaltrials.gov. Um, these are just some examples. Um, Zach, have I skipped through anything you want to add in so far? Uh, no, this is, um, you so know, good. this is good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one question is what to include in your pre-registrations. Um, and this is how much help you have here really varies a bit by field. So um, in psychology, there are actually um, some pretty clear templates for what people expect to see in a pre-registration. So this is an example from um, Van de Beer's uh, 2016 paper. Um, in other fields, there's, there's actually um, 
less guidance, I would say. So I'm a cognitive neuroscientist um, and there, uh, there's less uptake with pre-registration so far, I would say. Um, and so as a consequence, there's um, uh, fewer templates or, or guidelines for what things you should include and, and how you should organize your pre-registration. Um, an upside to that is that you can kind of do what's best for your project, which might be the, the best thing to do anyway. So when I was initially starting with pre-registrations, I had looked at these psychology templates and it was just immediately clear that they weren't, they weren't going to be helpful for me um, because what I needed to do was um, you know, specify which neural measure I was most interested in and why and how I was going to correct for motion and how I defined motion and things like that. And those, um, those variables just didn't kind of fall in naturally to the templates that existed. Um, yeah, so to jump off on that point, if, if you don't mind me um, jumping in. Um, I think a lot of people can get turned off from pre-registration in part because of the existing templates being really built around sort of traditional laboratory experimental studies relatively straightforward like whatever two by two or something and you know i'm going to do an anova and, or whatever like those sorts of pre-registrations are a little bit more straightforward neuroimaging clearly there are going to be other issues but for example i work with large naturalistic data sets like data from reddit the sheer amount of data you have for one creates all kinds of questions you can get you can ask all kinds of questions of these sorts of reddit data sets and so how do you go about doing a registration for something like that when there's many many ways you could think about the data or many kinds of data you could get from the the site so um we'll talk about things you can do to deal with that but one thing is to be aware that just because what you're working on doesn't fit into this sort of template doesn't mean that you can't do pre-registration. Um, there are some some resources that link to um, lots of different templates. So the OSF um, OSF has a page that's linked here um, with lots of different templates. Um, there's frequently updated step-by-step -step instructions on how to use OSF for pre-registration. Um, and so I've included some of these links here. Um, <laughs> But uh, but I think, um, like Zach said, it, I think kind of starting from these templates and looking at them, but then thinking about what you're trying to do, um, and and you know what what kind of specifying your analysis plan would look like given your the kind of data you work with, the kinds of questions you're hoping to ask. Um, it's it's possible that these templates um, might just be kind of an inspiration rather than a, a strict guideline, and that's fine. Um, so my pre-registrations always start from a blank word document. <laughs> Um, we also wanted to highlight that uh, pre-registering pre-registrations don't um, prevent you from exploring your data, um, and that exploratory analyses aren't inherently bad. Um, so, in fact, there's actually a, a very special role that exploratory analyses play in um, in our research, which is that they're useful for discovering patterns that we wouldn't have predicted, um, which might be important, and they can motivate future confirmatory work. Um, so, what the pre-registration does is not to prevent these kinds of analyses but it's um, meant to delineate to both yourself and to others which analyses were conform for confirmatory and planned and which ones were exploratory. So it's mostly a, a, a way to be transparent about the method rather than constraining you to a method. Zach, do you want to add anything there? I, I, have, a lot of to, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. I think some of it will come up in Q&A, no doubt. Um, I think, you know, exploratory analyses also can take the form, as you all know, that sometimes you're like thinking about, OK, how robust is this pre-registered analysis? So you, you have a pre-registered analysis and then you go, well, somebody might be skeptical of this or that. And so I'm going to run some exploratory analyses not to find new patterns necessarily, but actually to analyze the robustness of your pre-registered analysis. And that in that case, that seems sort of um, it seems to be working hand in hand right with the confirmatory analysis. Now there of course is flexibility then in kind of finding finding evidence that supports your pre-registered analysis and so you need to be careful about how to think about that sort of thing. Um, and um, you know you can even think about doing like subsequent pre-registrations on like testing the robustness of your pre-registered analysis. Um, but as we'll 
we should talk about in Q&A. Exploratory analyses are not inherently bad. It's just important to think about when am I confirming and when am I actually exploring my data set? Um, um, so then we'll just talk about a few challenges. These are um, things that I think most most often come up when people think about pre-registering. Um, one big one is that it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to think about um, all of the different paths that you might take in your analyses, and it does involve thinking about um, contingencies, or at least um, it, it, it can. So um, one thing that uh, Zach and I have talked about is that there can be different kinds of pre-registrations, right? So at the beginning of a project, you might have a very general pre-registration and as you kind of do multiple studies, depending on, again, the kind of studies that you do, um, if, it's, if it's possible to do multiple studies to address the same question, your pre-registrations can become more and more specific. And then again, the role of writing it down is simply to be transparent about that increasing specificity over time. Um, uh, and so, right, so it can, it can take a while to, if you're trying to make a very detailed analysis plan, um, it is a challenge to think through all of those contingencies. Um, and the documents can be pretty long, or at least in, in my research, they tend to be, um, again, because I specify both, you know, how I'm going to quantify motion and also how I'm going to quantify theory of mind and how I'm going to quantify neural responses and, you know, on and on and on. Um, but the upside, at least in my experience, is that if you've kind of gone through all of that effort early on in your project to, to, to complete the pre-registration, then the actual analysis part is quite quick. So in my experience, I don't think that it actually adds time. It just shifts when the time happens, when the time spent on that aspect of the project happens. Um, so instead of doing an analysis and then thinking about what the next step is and doing an analysis and then thinking about what the next step is and doing analysis or doing many, many analyses, um, you do all of the thinking part up front and then you just run it right through. Yeah, so um, I mean, you, it is a lot more work up front but there is something great about your data is in and you click go on your script and then you just see, you know, you see what happened. And if you already simulated, for example, responses from your participants before you even collected the data, then you know the script will run and, you know, so you're kind of over those hurdles. And then you just get to see, you know, some pretty figures at the end of it of what happened in your study that you were, you know, collecting data for months on. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with Hillary completely that it shifts where the work happens. Um, but actually what you'll find is when you put all that work up front, you discover issues with your analytic plan, you discover issues with your study design very early instead of realizing after it's too late um that you know this analytic plan doesn't make sense um, right yeah no that's definitely true it could end up shaping the, the actual experiment that you run um such that the analyses are the ones that you actually want to do that's true um with new projects it is often hard to know what to pre-register so again that's the idea of thinking that you could have a very general pre-registration um just again to be transparent about not being completely confident about how you should do this work um, another option is to have a pilot study, so collect data on your experiment that is purely for exploratory research um, to help you set an analysis plan. Um, so as long as that data, those data are you know, independent and not framed as confirmatory, you can, you can kind of, uh, again, just use them to, to dictate what you do next. Um, and it's also worth noting that deviations and amendments are sometimes necessary, so sometimes you say you're going to do something and then you realize later that that doesn't make sense, right? So we're learning all the time. Um, new methods uh, become, you know, uh, are, are created all the time, or maybe we come up with a new idea that we realize is better. Um, that that kind of has to be okay. Um, and so uh, whether it's of the format of, oh, I said this and that's just, that doesn't make sense, or, oh, I said this, but actually I want to do this new, better method now, um, both of those seem okay to me, and and so you just have to um, specify, right? So I made this change because I, you know, realized this thing about my data, or I made this change because this method with this paper was published, and it seemed like the better way to go. Um, and that's okay. As it's just about being transparent. I also think that with explore to early exploratory studies, um, Mike Michael Frank has a blog post call, I think it, the title is pre-register everything. And um, and so those pre-registrations can take a very general form. And 
so even for early projects, I'll have a, you know, in my R scripts, I always begin the R script with like, what is the project name? What is the population that I'm, you know, collecting from? And I'll also indicate that is the script exploratory or confirmatory? Um, and um, so oftentimes my early pre registrations will be exploratory things. And so they're quite general. It's sort of like, I want to test the relationship between this and that. And here's the model I think it's going to be to test that. But oftentimes that could change and get developed right as the project goes on. So as Hillary was saying, deviations and amendments are often pretty common especially when you're new, it's a new project. Um, and that that just has to make sense. You just have to be transparent about when that's happening because it's easy to fool yourself. It's not just about other researchers reading your scripts and thinking you're confirming. It's also, it's very easy to trick yourself and to be like, oh yeah, I thought that the whole time when, you know, no, you didn't. <laughs> you know, three months ago, you saw, thought something very different. <laughs> Um, and then a, a last challenge to mention is that um, it does require some buy-in and support from your collaborators and, and especially PIs since um, they tend to uh, kind of run the show in some ways. And so, you know, talking about these issues in this community, I think, is, is one way to, to help to learn how to talk about this and advocate for, for using these methods in your own research. Okay, um, I almost didn't include this slide because I think it's quite negative, but I, I do think it's worth um, just noting that uh, there are limitations to the things that pre-registrations can fix. So, you know, deliberate dishonesty or fraud would happen, uh, could happen in a pre-registration format. Um, uh, it doesn't, pre-registrations don't uh, prevent people from pre-registering studies after completing them or making bad pre-registrations or pre-registrations that include, uh, you know, questionable research practices, checking every single DV would, would, I guess, be just as bad, although more transparent than doing that without the pre-registration. Um, Pre-registrations that are unclear, um, so you know if they don't ever specify which covariate you're going to look at for language, that, that wouldn't be very helpful. Um, having these doesn't prevent people from ignoring them, dropping outcomes. Um, they don't fix confounded or boring experiments, um, and they don't fix having results that don't generalize. Um, and they certainly aren't substitutes for independent replications. Um, so these these are just kind of limitations to be aware of. Um, when you're thinking about why you're pre-registering, I, I think the key is really to think about just being transparent and having a, a, a record both for yourself and for your other uh, for others um, about what you did and when and why. Um, that that's the key. Um, but I know we're co uh, close on time, so we can switch to Q and A's if that's good, or Zach, if you have any end ending comments, that's fine too. I think it'd be helpful to just move to Q and A because I think a lot of the question, like questions, are going to highlight some of the issues and that are commonly come up with pre-registration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think we'll move to Q and A, and Dan has his hand up already. So um, I think Laura's going to stop recording.